You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Joining John today is Dr. Sergei Mashenko. Dr. Mashenko is a senior research associate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at McMaster University. He is a computational astrophysicist with interests in small scale problems of the standard cosmology, origin of dwarf galaxies and globular clusters, interstellar medium physics, and dynamics of minor celestial bodies. Sergei Mashenko, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, Sergey, you work with the a sort of a, an untold mystery of the Milky Way galaxy and other galaxies, the formation and weirdness of globular clusters and why we even have them. Give us a sort of an overview of the science of what we know about how these things even form. Uh, that's a very ambitious uh, question. So let me just try to cover it briefly. So global clusters, probably everyone knows, these are super dense, large collections of stars, clusters of stars. Uh, some of them have million or more stars. Most of them are very old, comparable to the age of the universe. And that sort of hints that probably at least some of them form very early in the history of the universe. But I should emphasize at this point, there is no firmly established model which tells us how and exactly uh, when and how these uh, objects form. What I think is the most plausible scenario is that some of these uh, objects, global clusters, formed quite early, before large galaxies like Milky Way galaxy was assembled, you know, in this hierarchical picture of uh, structure formation in the universe, starting with the Big Bang and then very small galaxies forming first. So it's very reasonable to assume the first global clusters formed in those very early small galaxies, we call them dwarf galaxies. Later on, the small galaxies were merging together and global clusters by being extremely dense objects. In fact, the stellar density of these objects is much higher than dark matter densities in those earlier galaxies and even less so in later galaxies. They should have survived, most of them, mostly intact by now. They could have been absorbed by larger galaxies as they destroy and tidally you know, digest smaller galaxies, but global clusters are just deposited into larger galaxies. And we, in fact, we see evidence of that in our own Milky Way galaxy. Some of you may know there is a famous Sagittarius uh, dwarf sort of galaxy, which is essentially destroyed as we watch it, tidally destroyed by Milky Way galaxy. It creates a huge arc across the sky, extremely faint stars. You need special telescopes, special technique to detect these stars but it's uh, like tens of angular degrees across the sky. And we see uh, global clusters, which used to belong to that small galaxy, and now they are being deposited into Milky Way. So currently in the Milky Way galaxy, we have uh, around 200 global clusters. I would say roughly half of them are believed to form very early before Milky Way was formed in those tiny small galaxies in early universe. The other half probably formed er later, when Milky Way itself was being assembled around redshift, I don't know, one or so, I know, like 10 billion years ago. So it is interesting. So it is quite possible these objects were formed in through different channels. Surprisingly, despite all of that, they have some very interesting, unique uniform properties, like their sizes are quite comparable, so-called half-light radius across all these different scenarios, different groups of global clusters. And this is something uh, any successful theory would have to explain. And I don't think there is a well-established explanation for that particular fact. Now, the action of dark matter. Now, can we see the effects? For example, when we look at galaxies, and this is how it was discovered, we look at galaxies and their motion, we can see that it's inconsistent with their mass invoking dark matter. Do we also see that evidence with globular clusters? Do we see evidence of dark matter within them? Okay, yeah, that, the last uh, words were important because you can also use global clusters to try to infer presence of dark matter in the host galaxy. And that's in fact, so there's sort of test particles moving through 
through the uh, host galaxy. And based on that, uh, this would be one another way to infer independently these host galaxies do have a lot of dark matter. Now to the actual to dark matter inside globular clusters. So that's something which has been speculated for a long time from a pioneering paper by Peebles uh, from 1984, I believe, where he imagined that global clusters formed in those tiny early universe, very dense. The dark matter density at that time was quite a bit higher than in modern galaxy. And they formed there and should have still dark matter up to now. Of course, that was sort of analytical picture, not numerical simulations. And there are so many complex things happen from that time in the early universe until we see global clusters in the Milky Way galaxy. So many things could have affected, even if there was dark matter initially, to the possibility it still sticks with the global clusters of today. So what was needed? Supercomputers, which appeared not a long time ago, and a couple of decades ago, powerful enough to model these things. And then models sophisticated enough which would describe what's happening to stars, what, what's happening to dark matter, what's happening to the host galaxy as it becomes part maybe of a larger galaxy uh, up to modern times. So it is still a matter of debate. So my own paper contribution to this research, research which uh, dates, uh, I know it's 2005 to 2006, so it's quite a while ago, being uh, recently checking more recent research, it is still a matter of debate, but it is highly cited, the research uh, we did, me, uh, myself and my co-authors. So there is still a lot of interest, but there is no firm conclusion yet whether indeed dark matter is currently present in global clusters. If it does, if it is, uh, it's actually a matter of great interest to people who try to understand what dark matter is. We still have not a clue what dark matter is. If it's truly a matter, it would consist of particles and it would indeed stick around inside global clusters. And if that's the case, it is very interesting that the density of dark matter inside global clusters would be much, much higher than inside any other conventional objects where we do discover dark matter, like dwarf galaxies, by one or two orders of magnitude, higher density. And that's very interesting because people who try to discover dark matter by trying to see a radiation from self-annihilation. So if you assume dark matter is something which interacts weakly with, with itself, which is still a big question mark if it does, if it does, then it would radiate certain photons, radiation, and the natural place to search for such radiation is inside objects like global clusters where dark matter density would be the highest. So the most recent papers I looked up recently, they did this kind of analysis. The, they still do not see any evidence of uh, dark matter inside global clusters in particular. And that allows them to place stricter and stricter constraints on how self-interacting a dark matter can be. That approach, unfortunately, that means, uh, I mean, we're not closer to understanding what dark matter is, but global clusters are great natural laboratories to try to uh, sort of narrow down the possible range of properties of dark matter particles. Now, if a globular cluster ends up having shed dark matter and the dark matter is no longer present, at least in the amounts that it should be as a gravitationally interactive something, then that also tells us that we may be dealing with something very exotic, right? That isn't like a normal particle. True. That, uh, that's uh, indeed can be one way to explain the fact that they don't see any manifestation, any special kind of radiation from global clusters originating from annihilating dark matter. The, there may be uh, also some somewhat more mundane explanation. As my model showed from like 15 years ago, I explored not what also is called a cuspy dark matter, density profiles, which means there is lots of lots of dark matter at the very center of a galaxy, or in this case, a global cluster. I also explored models where it, for some reason, became much uh, less dense, so flat, core distribution of dark matter. And some observation of galaxies suggest that's what is the case, for whatever reasons. Some of the reasons we explain in, some, in our other papers, which we may mention later today. So this is more mundane explanation. In my models, if you start with the dark matter distribution, which is not cuspy, but more like flat core from the very start, then you take such a global cluster with such dark matter and expose it to tidal forces inside host galaxy. 
then effectively you lose pretty much all your dark matter. So dark matter doesn't need to be exotic to be lost. But you're right, if it's indeed, it's not a matter, it's something else entirely, then that would be another possibility why we don't see any evidence of dark matter inside global clusters. The idea of dark matter annihilation evokes a certain term, and I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. Anti-dark matter. Could it exist? Could there be an antiparticle if, if say, dark matter is made up of wimps or something like that? a weakly interacting uh, particle, could there be an antiparticle to dark matter? Uh, that, that's not exactly my uh, research profile. So I don't think that would be the case because unless it's extremely small amount of antimatter mixed up somewhere, I think we would see a quite obvious signs of radiation of annihilation. So maybe I, I used earlier the word annihilation somewhat more uh, sort of generally. I think more specifically, I meant cross uh, self-interaction. I think that's the more appropriate word. So self-interacting dark matter, that's what we trying to find uh, signs of. To describe this effect, uh, researchers use basically uh, so the two parameters. There is a cross section and there is a mass of particle. And the chances of two dark matter particles colliding, interacting, and producing radiation are dependent on these two parameters. So the way it goes, the more massive dark matter particle is, the fewer of them are for the same given density of dark matter. So the more rare you would see interactions between particles. And in terms of cross-section, you can think of sort of effective size or really truly cross-section through blob particle. So the larger cross-section cross is, the more likely the interactions are, the more likely particles run into each other. My research in particular contributed to uh, people trying to discover dark matter using global clusters as natural laboratories, in the sense that allows them to narrow down the possible range of these two parameters of the mass of the particle and cross-section. We still don't see obvious evidence of radiation from dark matter interacting with itself. And that means the possible range of these two parameters becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And sometimes we are left wondering, is it actually a particle at all? Or maybe it's completely non-interacting with each other. As the original cold dark matter, original idea was it's absolutely non-interacting. So it's cold and non-interacting, but researchers hope they it does interact a little bit. And that would, in that case, allow us to discover it one day. Now, the idea of dark matter is, is interwoven intimately with gravity, which we don't really understand gravity either. And is it possible that we could be in a situation where we're misrecognizing something? We're looking for a simple answer that, oh, that gravity is being created by, by some kind of mass. But could it also simply be that we don't have a very good understanding of gravity at large scales? Definitely. We don't have a good understanding of what gravity is. It doesn't mean we cannot use very efficiently the idea of gravity and, for example, to discover dark matter through its gravity. We don't need to understand the nature of something to... You know, not to be able to use to explain a lot of other things in science. I indeed, uh, it's uh, one of the huge uh, puzzles what exactly gravity is. It's not my research profile, definitely, uh, but hopefully bright minds are hard at work and one day we'll know what the nature of gravity is. And that definitely will help us understand much better what universe is, like Big Bang, etc. Things are happening since Big, Big Bang. And maybe it would help us to understand what dark matter is. But uh, as it is, uh, I mean, we don't really have direct connection between, you know, we know there is matter, which is, well, we know there is something which acts as though it is matter with a mass. And that's how we detect dark matter. And not in one just context, in many, many different contexts. And that's why we're so confident. It's very, very likely it is out there. It is dark matter. But I always leave a possibility this is entirely something else. Yeah, the question is still open. Until we actually have a, you know, a, a 
rather complete theory of gravity, it's going to be hard to determine. But once we have that, if, you know, kind of coming at it from a different direction, from the theoretical physical direction, that we might be able to understand dark matter simply by understanding gravity. But at the same time, we could also discover some sort of a particle, you know, that that makes up dark matter. What do you think the more fruitful way to try to figure out dark matter is? Do you think that it's in the particle accelerator and looking at galaxies, or do you think it lies in theoretical physics? Uh, it's probably a feeling shared by many researchers uh, in this field. Maybe there is a growing frustration. <laughs> Despite our best efforts, we still can't detect it. Again, as I said, it's a question, even if it's a matter, it's, it's a matter of two parameters. And there is still room for these two parameters, cross-section mass uh, to be explored, maybe almost indefinitely. So we may not never be able to rule out the particle hypothesis for dark matter. But uh, I, I should say it's, it's quite frustrating. So it's been many years I've been following these research topics and all the papers you find uh, is basically negative. <laughs> so any dark matter research paper which tries to detect this as a particle, they either on Earth through in a lab or using natural labs like global clusters or you know dwarf spheroidal galaxies, other galaxies, what they do, they put more and more constraints and possible properties for dark matter. But it's it's very frustrating that we haven't discovered it yet. But you know, science is full of examples like Higgs particle, right? It, it took so many years to actually discover it, and it's been known it should exist, and we couldn't. I'm sure a lot of people were very frustrated and felt maybe it's it's not there, it doesn't exist, but it, sometimes it takes just enormous extra amount of efforts to be able to discover it. So it, I'm on the fence, to be honest. I think there is a high probability it is what it is, what we think it is. It's a dark matter particle. We just haven't zoomed in on the actual parameter space we need to explore, either in a lab or in a space. But I open the wide open the possibility is something completely different. And that's why we cannot discover it. And as time continues, as uh, we still don't discover the uh, dark matter particle. Uh, yeah, I'll be leaning more and more towards that uh, completely alternative way to explain it. Now back to globular clusters and their formation. Now, if if large amounts of dark matter were involved in that to make them as they are, you know, dense clusters of galaxies, then the question is, is that if you i mean can you form that now is do we still have the conditions in the universe to form new globular clusters oh yeah definitely now, for some interesting reason milky way galaxy doesn't do that anymore so we only have very old global cluster but, uh, i mean i haven't done a lot of research into that but as far as i know m31 our nearest large galaxy neighbor has much newer uh, still not very young but by galactic standards, I think a few billions of years versus uh, Milky Way's, you know, 12, 13 billion years, substanti substantially younger global clusters. And we definitely see examples of something which looks like new, brand new global clusters forming. I think there is a famous pair of merging galaxies, Antennae, two similar sized galaxies merging together. And researchers find super dense, super bright young clusters uh, are forming where these two galaxies are merging because of ram pressure, you know, the uh, gas from both galaxies colliding, creating shocks, huge increase in density, and that presumably what promotes formation super dense, modern day global clusters. That's terrifying because we are hurtling at breakneck speed towards the Andromeda galaxy and it's coming towards us and eventually there's going to be a merger. So could we end up in a situation during that merger, like the two galaxies you were mentioning, where we have new globular clusters forming in the, uh, let's call it the not too distant future, even though it's millions of years? It's many billions of years, as far as I uh, remember. We are not, I don't think we are as gas rich as the antennae galaxy I was talking about. So presumably it's going to be not as spectacular. I suspect between now and that remote time, there will be more dangerous <laughs> things happening, which may affect all of us, life on Earth, etc., within our Milky Way galaxy. Those enigmatic gamma ray bursts, um, you know, our central black hole becoming super active and becoming an AGN, active galactic uh, uh, nucleus, which can generate lots of, you know, high energy radiation, maybe wiping out life on uh, Earth. Uh, but again, all these things are on a billion years of scale. So uh, we're, we're very, very far away from any of these scenarios uh, coming to life. 
No, it's tomorrow as far as the entire lifetime of the universe, trillions and trillions of years, so it's tomorrow. And at any moment, geologically speaking, the, the Milky Way could turn back into a quasar and we're done. Uh, I don't think uh, that's the direction things so are more. So I think we see a lot of quasars mostly in the Yamge universe where things were much more active. Uh, I suspect uh, the reality is more in a sense, pessimistic things will be just slowly dying off as you know expansion of the universe continues. Galaxies on average will be further further away. So on those scales you're talking about, up to a trillion years, so stars pretty much all dying off, and we are in a darkness and nothing's happening. That I think that's maybe worse uh, scenario for very very long term. But yeah, again, it's uh, we are trillion years away from that, that picture. Now, the environment of a globular cluster, um, at first glance, from a SETI perspective, it seems that that huge concentration of stars would be a good place to look for evidence of alien civilizations. But then you wonder about the radiation environment. Do you think that globular clusters offer us any kind of opportunity for searching for intelligent alien life? You're definitely not the first person with this kind of idea. I remember one of the first experiment trying to communicate with other civilization by sending a signal radio signal was towards one of the nearby global clusters i'm afraid from what we know now i would think they're much less likely places to find not even civilization but planets we i don't think we have much understanding if there are much planets inside global clusters for two reasons uh, one uh, global clusters they're old objects and the stars they have, have uh, we call low metallicity so they don't have much in terms of stuff a planet and life is made of so uh, this is a reflection of the fact that they were formed early in the universe when there were not too many of these uh, metals in the interstellar gas and these metals were produced by supernovae so first you form stars in the universe then they explode the supernova they enrich the gas between stars which was originally just hydrogen helium and that allows you to form planets and to form life uh, on those planets, presumably. Global clusters are quite old. They have low metallicity. So that one of the factors, perhaps, that they don't have planets or don't have many planets. And second, the density of stars is such a tremendous. There is such frequent interaction between stars moving really, really close to each other that stability of planetary system is a big question so uh, chances are planets wouldn't survive uh, for a long time inside global clusters so i wouldn't even worry about radiation things like that i think things would be really bad and sort of uh, for life even before you reach the, to that point during the formation of the globular clusters the ancient ones you know um, we're looking at very early objects in some of these. Now, the elusive population three stars, are these places, would this be fruitful ground to search for the very, very earliest stars in the universe by looking at very distant galaxies with globular clusters in them? Uh, just want to make clear distinction. Global clusters are classical population two stars. So in a sense, so population three, these are the very first stars in the universe. It's an active uh, area of research yet. Hopefully the new James Webb telescope might be able to make such a discovery. Some of these stars might have been extremely massive, maybe 10,000 masses of sun. So these would be very interesting times coming if you do discover these objects. But these objects were essentially metal free. There was just mostly pristine helium, hydrogen gas. And global clusters form a bit later on when those things exploded, enrich the interstellar intergalactic medium, and then you form more traditional stars, which are just roughly uh, masses and sizes of stars we see today. And later on, it was population one, like uh, our own sun. So it's the big, so clear distinction. So very first stars in the universe will be population three, and we know little about that or almost nothing. The theoretical field is very active. I've been following papers recently, and it's all over the place. Some people say it wasn't actually stars; it things collapsed directly into intermediate mass black holes around ten thousand solar mass. So it wasn't even a star in a strict uh, sense of the word. Others saying it was supermassive stars which lived very short life and exploded. And yet other research says they were not super massive. They were slightly more massive than population two. So there is a huge uncertainty about population three stars, but global clusters are more familiar, something which we have bad understanding of. And we have some cosmological models, including the research uh, me and uh, myself and my co-authors published 
a few years back where we see these objects which looks like global clusters forming in the early universe inside small galaxies. Inside small galaxies. So can James Webb offer us a way to probe that? So if we look at high redshift, very ancient galaxies, very distantly, can we look at the very beginnings, the formation of the globular clusters there? Uh, I haven't looked into exact numbers. I suspect James Webb would not be powerful enough to directly see those first global clusters forming in the early universe. But it might be possible if coincidentally we have a gravitational lens, strong lens between ourselves and those first global clusters forming a, a large galaxy or maybe clusters of a galaxy, which would serve as a magnifying lens and increasing the brightness of background objects by a factor of you know, 30 or more. The Hubble Space Telescope became famous for discovering such magnified background objects. So I wouldn't rule out that James Webb Telescope will be able to discover first global clusters uh, using uh, gravitational lensing. Uh. Now, tell us about your YouTube channel, Astro Edge. What, uh, what are you looking to do? What are you looking to teach people with this channel? It's an experiment. So far, I created only five episodes. Here's the premise. As an astronomer, researcher, my morning starts with going to a website. It's archive.org, uh, A-R-X-I-V.org, where astronomers from all over the world submit their early research as preprints. So these are papers which hasn't, haven't been published yet. And roughly 40, 50 a day. So in a week, we get around three, 400 new research papers, preprints submitted to this website. So it's my morning routine to check those abstracts, at least of those papers, sometimes reading the whole paper, if it's interesting, uh, just to be, uh, you know, updated about all the current research. And then I realized if I do it anyway, I spend my time every morning, I might as well pick one or maybe a few a week, which I think would be the most interesting to explain to general public. The problem with this website, these papers are written by researchers for researchers. So if you are not a scientist, you will be completely lost trying to understand what's the most current uh, discoveries and trends in science. A lot of these papers can be very interesting, but they come go unnoticed by standard media, right? News outlets, etc. Because uh, something needs to happen to bring this to their focus and a lot of great research goes unnoticed. So uh, here's my idea. I find those uh, interesting research papers, preprints, and make a short video about that, trying to explain in layman's terms, basically to general public, what's interesting about this paper uh, and how it fits into our current trends and current sort of directions the research is going. So I, I've done five episodes so far. We, I'm a, a bit of a technical uh, uh, delay right now for I haven't done anything for two weeks, but I plan to restart it. And, uh, and the hope is uh, this will bring mainstream bleeding edge or bleeding edge research in astro astronomy astrophysics closer to general public to make it more accessible uh, to general public. And there will be a link below to your channel for anybody interested in taking a look. And now, Sergey, I also spend my morning coffee <laughs> on, on archive reading the papers. And it seems to me that that, that particular website, that Preprint that way of showing papers publicly for free. Anybody can go there and, and read them. Is a massive development in information interchange within astrophysics, perhaps the greatest ever. Do you think that? Do you think similarly along the lines that this is like the invention of the printing press for astrophysics? Indeed, it's probably this enormous amount of uh, resource uh, information is uh, untapped to a large degree. Uh, I wonder if things we are playing with, artificial intelligence, etc., would maybe help make a better use of this. But even for hu for us humans, it's a huge, huge, important source of information. Over the last 20 or what, more years I've been doing research actively, I just can't imagine me doing research without dealing with this archive website on a daily basis. Because this is a place you go to look up references, to look up prior research on any particular topic to see if someone already done something similar uh, or uh, to get ideas. Uh, one of the reasons I do this uh, every morning, I check this archive preprints, just to hoping to get ideas for, for my new research. And Umuamua, the paper I did recently, was purely from me checking every morning archive uh, portal. 
and reading the first papers to know more and more. And then I had this uh, like lightning, the idea that's what it is. That's what all this object is. And then it took me one year to prove my idea. But remember, it took me minutes to figure that out, to have the idea uh, from reading the archive uh, portal. Do you see this as the future of scientific interchange? In other words, will there be archive-like sites for all areas of science because it's been so successful? And I've talked to many scientists on this show, and it, 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 that's it's all of our morning coffee, you know, <laughs> is and even in universities where the you know the discussion of what showed up on archive that day is you know one of the you know on the agenda. So, do you think that this is the model for all of science eventually? Uh, well, archive did move. I'm not sure if it was from the start or it joined later. It has things beyond astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, so I'm looking at it now. It has condensed matter physics, basically other kinds of physics, quantum physics, nuclear physics, mathematical physics, high energy physics, uh, general relativity, some mathematics, some computer science, uh, some biology. So yeah, finance, uh, it looks like things are actually expanding because originally I think it was a lot about astrophysics, maybe some physics, but I can see other fields are joining. And it makes total sense. It's one place where you put all those research results. That's one thing. Things like, you know, nature, science, other high profile publications. It's hard to find the original text. Go to this website and find not exact form, published form, but you find the preprint, which is very close to the final published form. Uh, so it's all free. It's a great advantage. And also the fact that it's in one location and the fact it's a preprint. So it's not published research yet. It's the intermediate stage. Sometimes it's before submission, during submission, before first review, after first review. So it allows you to see the research happening now, not waiting until it's actually accepted and published, which takes another six to nine months. Now, in the monitoring archive, what is the biggest unreported story that you've seen there? In other words, a paper that was of utmost importance that the media simply missed? I became interested with media angle relatively recently when I started my YouTube channel, Astrage. So I can only be based on that uh, recent a few weeks. I've been doing that. Let me think. I would say most of my episodes I've done. So I've done five so far. I don't think they had much of a major media uh, impact or presence. So, and they were very all, they were all very interesting papers. So I would say a significant number of papers go unnoticed by mainstream media. And so this uh, archive website is a great resource for anyone like myself, or maybe like yourself, uh, who are trying to popularize science. And this is a great source of information. There is room for many, many people like us because physically I cannot cover more than one paper a week and I, I make a short list maybe five to ten a week uh, and I know they're extremely interesting papers I just can't physically cannot cover in my episodes I have to pick one sometimes you know you know with a it hurts that you have to pick one among a few excellent papers and some of them do end up being in the mainstream media, uh, typically in a high profile uh, journals like Nature and Science. And maybe it actually kind of pushes me slightly away from such papers. So maybe I'm, I'm trying to, avoid, because I know they're going to be covered in a great deal by uh, main uh, mainstream media. And I try to focus on papers, more uh, regular astrophysical publication, and which I find very interesting to general public. And uh, yeah, that's my focus. I find it encouraging, actually, because it even if you just read the abstract and you just go there, there are tens of papers every day coming out, you know, these preprints. And the fact is, is that it speaks very well to the health of the scientific community because it shows that there is a lot of thought and a lot of debate going on that happens on archive, you know. It, a good example here would be Tabby Star, you know, which I covered extensively early in my YouTube career, you know, this weirdly dimming star. And... All of the debate happened on archive, you know, just people posting papers and going back and forth to try to figure out exactly what was going on there, which now appears to be, you know, some weird phenomenon of dust. But it just showed the health of the, of these fields that the the debate is robust and it's facilitated by by um, things like archive. Don't you agree? Totally agree. In fact, in my recent history, I've been paying even more attention to this website. I've seen uh, interesting publication 
and then a paper which says it's wrong, <laughs> published the same day on our archive. So somehow, well, I guess the original publication was published elsewhere, and then it appeared on Kraft, uh coincidentally the same day as another researcher's finding a flaw, a potential flaw in the original research, and published the same day on archives. So it's you looking through your daily list of papers, you see both the paper and paper which, which argues against the first one, which is very interesting. And it, it's the shows the health of uh, of uh, well, astronomy in general research. And this particular approach, archive, where it's uh, for everyone to see. So everyone can see this early result, not published yet. And there is opportunity for all researchers to contribute, to contact the authors. If you find obvious flaw, you're welcome to contact the author. This is one of the reasons people publish their research as a preprint on archive, not waiting until it's fully officially published on the official research uh, uh, mag uh, journal. Uh, so it's a great way to improve quality of research through this uh, feedback. For anybody interested out in the audience, it's uh, A-R-X-I-V. It's That's how it's spelled. And you just go there and you'll be able to see all of the cutting edge, edge papers, or at least a, a good amount of them, and um, without having to pay anything for it. And you can just look at the pulse of science right there. Um, so get back to globular clusters again. Now, low metallicity stars, okay, simple stars, simple chemical makeup. Do we see any anomalies, though, uh, when we look at the individual stars of globular clusters? I mean, do we do surveys of the individual stars in them? Hmm. Okay, it really rings a bell. Uh, by the way, on topic of archive, many astronomy departments, including my university, McMaster University, has the tradition of having a go journal club. So once a week, one of grad students would pick a paper from uh, archive and explain it to us. Uh, so, and I remember a recent paper, exactly what you were asking of, uh, and I'm trying to remember the details. So um, there is a lot of going on about uh, peculiarities of chemical composition of stars, uh, and in particular in clusters and in global clusters. Yeah, I'm positive that uh, uh, journal club was about uh, global cluster stars. And uh, from what I gather, the it's still very, very active uh, field of research. In fact, I remember there was a, a table assembled uh, during this presentation that shows a number of strange things about stars and global clusters in terms, in terms of their chemistry. And I think the list was like more than 10 strange things. And then uh, orthogonal, it was like uh, columns and then rows where the theories suggested to explain some of these uh, peculiarities, maybe six or so uh, different theories. And in, on the intersection, there are things which uh, theory can actually explain. And so most of that table was red crosses, which means <laughs> most of things we cannot explain. And there is not a single theory which explain more than a few of strange things about stars and global clusters. That shows uh, this is really an uh, active area of research because we really don't understand uh, why stars have certain properties in global clusters in terms of a chemistry, in terms of their uh, spin, how they rotate. Some stars are spinning fast, others slow. Uh, and yes, this is a lot of interesting things to come because we don't have one good theory which would explain most of these strange uh, facts about stars and global clusters. Yeah, when you really think about it, the, <laughs> the dynamics of that, if you've got a bunch of stars like that all spinning at different <laughs> rates, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, what, what, what stage in the formation of that globular cluster caused that? Interesting area of research and a great mystery, really, largely still very mysterious. Um, Sergey, we are out of time and uh, thanks for joining us today. And everybody should check out Sergey's YouTube channel, Astro Edge. And uh, thanks for uh, joining us and I hope you'll do it again sometime. Thank you very much for having me. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.